Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky. I'm Associate Director for the Digital Department here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. I'd like to welcome you all to this month's uh, live chat with Nurse Linda. And I want to tell you about Linda. She's a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for 40 years. And she also writes in our Ask a Nurse blog up in our online community forum. And she conducts monthly international webinars like today. And she also talks a lot about on the web, on the community forum, excuse me, um, all the questions um, that you leave from individuals with paralysis. And now I'd like to welcome Linda to this month's live chat. And hello, Linda. Hi, and thank you. It's uh, so nice to be here today. Being that it's such a big day in the community of individuals with spinal cord injury, first and foremost, um, yesterday was the birthday of Christopher Reeve, and so it's always nice to stop and take a moment and think about him and recall all the wonderful things that he has done to help uh, perpetuate health care in the United States and around the world, not only for people with spinal cord injury and paralysis, but also for people with all kinds of abilities. And so um, I was fortunate enough to get to know him on quite a personal basis and work with him in his recovery. And um, one thing that I saw in his recovery was this progression from a person who, like everybody else, was interested in what kind of treatments could be used to help him. And then you would see this evolution of, well, let's put this information out to other people. And then on to um, people who have other kinds of injuries besides spinal cord injury. And finally, on to the bigger picture of um, really rewriting healthcare care uh, initiatives through payer sources and getting all kinds of funding. So quite a monumental um, uh, process that he went through personally, but then also uh, let the rest of everyone in the world really take advantage of his work. So um, it's, it's always kind of nice to stop and think about that on his birthday. Um, one of the things that he did was to start the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation, of which uh, sponsors the Nurse Linda blog and webinar. And so that was one really great outcome that uh, came from his work was providing information, education, networking, um, and then also through his wife Dana to create ways for families to um, deal with and help take care of the person who has a, a long-term disability. And so that brings us to the events that have transpired um, over the last few days. And there's been several significant announcements in research and in uh, the recovery of spinal cord injury. And so I'm going to talk about those in a little bit, but I hope to pull it all together with some other information. So uh, recently, this over this last month, I've been uh, discussing on the blog things about um, things, reasons why your body wants to get better and how the body works a little bit in striving to get better. So if you think about the proverbial paper cut, such a simple little injury causes a lot of pain. Um, you know, it was really kind of annoying, but it doesn't really stop you from doing too much. But you get a little paper cut and you see some redness, some swelling. Because the body is always trying to heal itself, we can see it on our skin because that's the organ that we can see is the skin. And so you see a little paper cut, you see a lot of fluid, some redness going to that area, there's some swelling there. And that's the body trying to heal itself. And you can easily see that, and sometimes in a paper cut, you might get it in the morning, by noon it might be gone. And so the body has recovered from that injury. Um, the same sort of thing happens if you have a spinal cord injury, a brain injury, some kind of problem in the nervous system or any system in the body. Uh, but when, when the nervous system also it is under some kind of injury, either from disease or from trauma, it will want to heal itself, and the process is the same. Whereas fluid rushes to that area, there's um, cells in your body that will take away if there's an infection, they'll work on um, removing 
damaged tissue. Um, the cells inside the body will uh, organize themselves to protect themselves. The problem is that in the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system is housed in bones. So the, there's the skull that houses the brain, and then there's the vertebrae that houses the, all of the spinal cord. So when the swelling occurs in the nervous system, there's no place for it for the swell, swelling to expand in the nervous system because the bones have encapsulated to protect the very, very delicate tissue of the nervous system. So the body has this automatic protection. So, you know, if you bump your head, you have that skull up there that's protecting your head. Or if you... Um, fall and hurt your injure your back you have that skeleton there to help protect that delicate nervous tissue but healing still goes on and that's the way the body knows how to heal itself is to send fluid to help cushion and protect the damaged area what happens is those bones cannot accommodate that you know if you fall down and you break your arm and that bone is broken your arm will swell or if you break some other part of your body or if you have a problem in your abdomen it will swell to accommodate this but your your central nervous system cannot do that so the only thing that can happen is that that swelling will push on the nervous tissue because there's only so much room within that uh, skull and vertebrae so the swelling will push and damage more nervous tissue just due to the swelling. So getting that swelling down is one of the key elements um, for um, recovery of spinal cord injury. But um, once that damage has occurred, the body will still continue to try to heal itself. And it does this through a system that's called neuroplasticity. So if you think about plastics, you can mold plastics into any kind of form, and that's what the nervous system will try to do it will try to correct itself by working differently. So if you have a pathway from your brain down to your toe and it gets interrupted through a spinal cord injury, you might not be able to feel or move your toe. But the brain will try to work around that and will create other pathways. So a couple of things happen in your body. Um, one of the old jokes is about, you know, um, in college maybe or some particular time in your life, maybe you'd go out drinking and somebody would say, well, I'm going to drink this beer now and I'm going to kill off so many brain cells. Well, this is not exactly true. It used to be thought of years and years ago that once you damaged a nerve in your nervous system that it was just gone, it was over. But in the recent years, we have certainly learned a lot different about that. We found out that the nervous system is always trying to protect itself. It's always trying to heal itself. And this never stops, even as you get to be very old. So sometimes people think, oh, I've entered my more mature years and I'm I, my brain now is at its fully formed. No, it's always regenerating itself. Another thing that um, has been discovered is in the spinal cord, it seems like back from our ancient ancestors, there's a rudimentary process where people can walk without control from their brain. So there's something in the spinal cord called a pattern generator. And once your uh, body gets walking, it kind of this pattern generator kind of takes over and becomes a, a very rough rudimentary system for keeping your legs moving in a walking pattern. And it will keep going until it gets interrupted in some way. This is why we need the brain to control, to tell us when to start, to tell us when to stop, uh, really to make the body work under the conditions that we want it to do whatever it is we want it to do. Um, one of the things that the brain does, it's always correcting. So if you're walking along, um, your gait might not be exactly even on both sides because we know that our bodies are a little bit different on either side. And so you might uh, stumble, you might drag your toe a little bit, but the brain will correct for that. If you're going just by using the pattern generator, the brain cannot uh, do that correction. And so sometimes people get stumbled, and that's why they um, stop walking using this rudimentary uh, pattern generator. It was quite controversial a while back because nobody could see it. You can't point to it anatomically and say, there's the spot 
that's the pattern generator. It's a system, it's a physiological process within the spinal cord that just causes uh, people to move in a certain way. So knowing those couple of things, I'm going to deviate off for a minute, but knowing those couple of things, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, some of these new discoveries. So a question had come in earlier about a person who is interested, they have had a spinal cord injury, and as we all know, it's very difficult uh, to control weight sometimes after spinal cord injury because um, you, you just tend, you're not using a lot of calories, you might be taking in a lot more calories. So the person had written in because they had heard about a diet um, which is a, it's called the Magic Nut Diet, and it's a, literally a nut that comes from India. And people have been taking this, and they've been losing weight with it. So I thought, uh-oh, well, as like everyone else on earth, I would be very interested in a Magic Nut Diet that made mis- weight mystically uh, just dissolve away. But when I read up about the, this nut, what happens is is that you get enough of the nut uh, in the strength that's manufactured, and what happens is that the um, the nuts tend to make people have go to the bathroom, makes them have bowel movements. And so, if you get enough of this nut in this powdered drink, what happens is it gives you diarrhea. People who have diarrhea lose weight because they're losing all that water, and all that uh, food is slipping through their bowel too quickly. And that's what's happening when you get diarrhea. So um, the other part about when you get diarrhea is because the nutrients are going through your body so quickly, the bowel can absorb the nutrients out of the food. So what happens is you get a chemical imbalance in your body. And what can happen is that this chemical, your body runs by chemicals. Your nerves uh, transmit messages through chemical reactions. Your heart beats by using chemical reactions. So nutrients in our body are very, very important to keep everything uh, status quo and keep us healthy. So if you have diarrhea for an extended period of time, you need to be very careful because you lose a lot of potassium with diarrhea. And potassium is important to the body. Now, but it's very significant to maintain potassium through uh, normal food channels. Some people have cardiac problems and they're given extra potassium because of medication that they're taking. But average everyday people should not need to do that. It's only if you have special cardiac problems. So when you lose all this potassium, what happens is your heart can malfunction. So going on a diet that produces diarrhea, which then produces, it's not real weight loss because you're not losing fat, you're just losing fluid. So what happens is you lose all this potassium, which can lead to cardiac arrhythmia and even death. So be careful if you're on any kind of diet that is uh, causing you to lose weight or water or fluid through diarrhea. So basically the question is how to lose weight safely. Well, I can tell you as as most um, Americans and probably a lot of people around the world who are interested in losing weight. There is no magic system to this. Weight loss is simply a matter of the number of calories in versus the amount of calories that you expend through movement or just through living. Just sitting and breathing or laying down and breathing expends a certain amount of calories, not very much. When we go out and exercise, you lose, uh, you uh, utilize more calories, uh, but still, it's not going to be that many calories that you can even uh, use through exercise. So, to lose weight, people need to lower their calorie intake and increase their calorie output. Now, um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. If there was a super diet that was really working for Uh, everyone, I think we would all hear about that and we would all be doing that. Um, A lot of of this uh, weight loss and weight control in our country really has uh, has been impacted by our culture. 
So in the United States, we're a big country. We have a lot of land. We live large. We eat large food in large portions. So looking at portion control is really important um, and keeping up with some kind of activity. Now, you know there's that old joke about, you know, don't join a gym in January because it's crowded with people with their New Year's resolutions and they're all exercising because they're all going to lose their holiday weight and et cetera. But in reality, what happens is by about the middle of January, certainly by February, that volume of people is gone. So you don't really want to go to the gym until February because it won't be so crowded. So this is just the nature of our culture, and so it's something that we have to think about. Now, interestingly enough, um, on the 21st, today being the 26th, so just a few days ago, there was a new study that was released by um, a group that was led by Yar and Fish, Yar de, hyphen Fisher, so last name Y A R A hyphen Fisher and her group in spinal cord series cases. And what they had found is that they had um, put some done a research project, and they had asked people who had spinal cord injury to eat the ketogenic diet. Now that's a diet that's going around which is high fat and low carb. And so these people were on this diet, and they found that um, what they were looking for was if their um, bodies had any kind of neural protection. So in the in the neuro system and the nervous system, was there any protection by eating this uh, ketogenic diet? And they, they thought, the outcome was that they thought there was that there was. And what the issue about that neural protection is, and I wrote about this a few weeks ago, is one of the thoughts about uh, spinal cord injury is that whenever your body has extreme stress from any kind of thing, it could be from some psychological problem, it could be from a heart problem, it could be from a muscular problem, any kind of stress that you're undergoing, like a spinal cord injury is a huge stressor to the body, that your body gets this inflammation, this swelling, this increase of fluid in the area of, of, the, um, of the problem. And so what is thought theoretically about this inflammation is that these markers for inflammation, even though that swelling goes away, these markers for inflammation stay in your body for years. And it, they don't know how long. Some, some people say it's for a few months. Some people say it's for a number of years. Some people say it depends on what type of injury it was. So there's, there's not a clear-cut answer about the inflammation. And so uh, what they found was that this uh, ketogenic diet seemed to help the inflammation. Now, that doesn't say anything about weight loss. But for anybody who's interested in that, I suggest that you talk with your healthcare professional and see what kind of diet would be best for you. A lot of research about diet has indicated it doesn't matter what diet you're on, it's just that you're following a diet that makes the difference. And the reason why it makes a difference is that you're being conscientious about what you're eating and putting into your body. So you're monitoring those number of calories, you're thinking about the energy expended, you're weighing yourself, you're really being careful about, mm, should I, there's a little bowl of candy, I'm in the office, should I walk by and pick up a couple of M&Ms, people who are on a diet will think, no, I, I shouldn't put those extra calories into my body. So people just naturally lessen their calories when they're on a diet because they're monitoring that. Now, some people have had a lot of success with the Weight Watchers diet, and that's, an, that's a good diet. Other people don't have so much success with that because it's too much food. Again, you have to think about the amount of uh, calories that you're exerting. So check with your um, physician and see what would be the best diet for you because you don't want to get on one of these diets where you're using some kind of even over-the-counter medication, uh, diuretics, laxatives, any kind of drugs that's going to pull those electrolytes out of your body and cause you more harm than good. So um, there's new diets out now that if you um, don't eat at certain times, if you don't eat after 2 o'clock, um, that, that works better. For some people that might work out, but if you have an, any kind of chronic condition, 
like a spinal cord injury. If you have low blood pressure, you don't want to be decreasing your amount of food, foods and fluids after 2 o'clock because you're going to further uh, aggravate your low blood pressure and pass out. So maintaining a little bit of food over a, over the course of a day seems to work a lot better for people who have a spinal cord injury, not allowing themselves to become hungry because they're having a little tiny bite or two um, every so often. Now, the second part of, to this question was um, about uh, tone and how, you know, how when you're sitting, and it doesn't matter if you have a spinal cord injury or if you don't have a spinal cord injury, people who tend to sit or move less tend to get a, a little bit of a spread in the middle on the back side on, on their legs. And the reason for that is because you're just not using those muscles enough. So exercise is about the only way that you're going to be able uh, to shape your lower body. So some people you say to me, well, Linda, I, I have a spinal cord injury. I can't move my lower extremities. But you can move them externally. You can move your legs you can do your range of motion exercises. Um, you can engage in some of the advanced therapies if you have access to those to help tone and shape your lower body or um, the body that's affected below the, the level of injury. So those are just some things that you can do. It's not a satisfactory answer. I'm sure not for this uh, uh, reader that's interested in uh, you know weight control. But it is the real answer, and so that's what we know right now. So what do we do about all of this? So this is where the big news of the week has come in. There's been three studies that were released this week, and um, they all are very hopeful for individuals who have any kind of paralysis. Um, one study was done by uh, Reggie Edgerton, Dr. Reggie Edgerton at the UCLA with the Mayo Clinic where they did some epidural stimulation. Now, if you've been following the research in spinal cord injury, you will know that there has been a, a transmitter, a little device that has been developed that is implanted that helps bridge that disconnection uh, above and below the spinal cord injury. So years ago, and this is years ago, we used to think that to, to reconnect the spinal cord, you had to connect make those connections work between individual nerves. So if you had a nerve that did one thing, it had to connect with its original connecting nerve. But we know that in spinal cord injury, sometimes those nerves aren't working. What we found out years ago is you don't have to do that. You just have to make a connection from one nerve above the injury to one nerve below the injury, and the body will remap itself and take care of that getting the directions where it needs to go. So Dr. Edgerton has been working with people um, uh, using epidural stimulation and rehabilitation, and he's made some uh, vast improvements in people who have epidural stim that are able to ambulate using device, uh, devices like a walker and um, using the stimulator and extensive rehabilitation. So this is not like, a, well, you put the stimulator in and whoops, you're all better. It's not quite that way. It's still a lot of work. One of the things that he has really um, capitalized on and has really demonstrated is the use of that pattern generator in the spine. So if we had any holdouts who were thinking that the pattern generator was just a mythical um, thing, no, he's really demonstrated because he thinks that what he's doing with his epidural stimulation is harnessing that pattern generator to get people um, to be able to walk. Um, he did his study with a person who's paraplegic. Um, we also have Dr. Susan Harkima at the University of Louisville who released another study with using uh, individuals who had uh, chronic uh, spinal cord injury. So spinal cord injury, that's not new, but three or four years uh, in duration. And she's um, some individuals who had some high cervical injury, some thoracic injury, and um, she had success with these people being able to ambulate with um, Walker, uh, much like Dr. Reg uh, Edgerton. 
Um, but now in her article, it's very interesting because here again, this is not a quick fix. It's not putting in the epidural stimulator and then uh, you wake up after surgery and, you know, things are all better. This is, you know, it's a lot of work still. Um, so she had her patients, they um, did 278 therapy sessions in 15 weeks to achieve their goal with an uh, uh, epidural stimulator. So it's still a lot of therapy. It's still a lot of reorganization. It's still a lot of work. But these are huge steps forward. Um, also at the University of Louisville, there was a separate study that was done. And uh, they looked at uh, individuals, uh, an individual who had quadriplegia who had the epidural stimulator placed and the cardi her cardiovascular system was so very much improved and breathing and et cetera. So this, this study looked at some of the secondary complications of spinal cord injury. So of course the, um, the thing that everybody wants is to be able to walk and move around and toilet and do all these activities. But also there's those secondary complications that affect breathing and the cardiovascular system. And so um, the epidural stimulation has helped those. So we really need to thank uh, Dr. Edgerton and Dr. Harkima. Um, these are people and their teams. We must not forget they did not work in isolation, but they had teams of people working as well. And they really deserve our thanks. These um, researchers have worked tirelessly for years, often without any kind of uh, accolades, but making small incremental steps to lead to this day. So this is a wonderful step forward. Um, it, it seems to be the beginning of a new era. I know that for somebody who's sitting in a chair waiting for the cure to come, one year, one month, one second is too long to wait. But we're right at the prefaces of a huge revolution in spinal cord injury and thanks to these people who have worked tirelessly for years and years to get to this point to be able to do these studies. So really um, quite a wonderful um, discoveries that have been announced that um, people in spinal cord injury have known that these studies have been going on. We've known about the earlier studies when uh, electrodes were put on people's skin to pedal bikes and everybody said, oh my gosh, you're going to damage these nerves and you're doing this and oh, this is horrible, horrible, horrible. And guess what? Nobody's nerves got damaged and people improved. And then these scientists have harnessed that. They've worked with those studies. They've harnessed it and they've moved it forward into the current studies that we have. So we're going to be seeing a lot of things going on um, over the next few years. And um, happy birthday, Christopher Reeve, because your dream is coming true. So really great times. Um, as I said, when you're sitting in the chair waiting, it's very difficult, but um, know that a huge step has been taken forward. And I think we're going to see just this, I think this is just going to explode out of the world. Now, the uh, Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation has financially supported these researchers as well as others who are doing critical work. They also have a study that uh, they're spearheading um, called The Big Idea, which is um, the same kind of work. So, and, and this work is going on around the world with other scientists and other research labs. What is important about research is it's not just if one person can get an outcome, but if the study can be repeated with the same outcome, and if it can be repeated by different people. So we have two um, studies here in the United States in completely separate labs that have demonstrated that same outcomes. There's studies going on with epidural stimulation around the world that's uh, re resulting in the same kind of outcomes. So the more we get replicated of the same work, the more we know that this is a true fact. So here we are, standing right on the edge. So um, I tie this in with a weight control question because to be able to do this 
uh, therapy, you need to be able to stand up and hold up your body. And the uh, stimulator is going to help activate your muscles and nerves. But, you know, it's a lot easier to move less weight. So this is why the weight control question is such a huge, important question for today. So... um, there's a link that's been posted. Uh, thanks, Jen. Always on top of it that Jen is. Um, so she's put a link to uh, this day about uh, what's going on with the spinal cord epidural uh, stimulation. So if you want more information about that, be sure and log on because these are really critical studies. This is just like a huge week, just huge. So let's look at some of the other questions that are um, going on because it's all going to tie in to this epidural stimulation, and I'm so happy that we're able to talk about it now. Um, I know that sometimes people are sitting out there and they're thinking, well, I don't really have access to this. And today, uh, yeah, not many people have access to this. This is still experimental. It's not a standard of care. It's it's still being um, researched in laboratories. But it's coming so quickly now that, you know, it's just hang on tight because here it comes. The dams have broken and here it comes. Um, so this is a big day. Okay, so we do have a qu- some questions on here. Um, so does lower limb spasticity following spinal cord surgery a- from AV malformation get worse over time, improve, or remain static given that all exercises and routines are kept up? Well... The answer to that question is yes to all of those. (laughs) So let's break that down a little bit. So lower limb spasticity is a problem when you have an injury to the cervical or thoracic spinal cord. So if you relate it to your bones, it's in your neck or it's in your back where your ribs come out of your vertebrae. Um, In your neck's the cervical, and then where your ribs come out of your backbones, that's the thoracic. And then that little dip that goes in your back, that's the lumbar. And then the sacrum is at the end, at the what we call the tail of the spinal cord. So um, if you're having spasticity, that means probably the injury is in the cervical or the uh, thoracic uh, spine. And it can improve, it can get worse, and it can stay the same. Especially if you have uh, the injury from a malformation, um, we don't really know what's going on inside of there, so we just have to see, you know, how every person turns out. So it's important to keep up your exercises because spasticity is the first level of treatment is to uh, stretch those uh, nerves that are causing the spasms. And so doing some stretching exercises, doing those range of motion exercises are going to stretch those nerves. As I said at the beginning, the body wants to heal itself. And so those nerves in your lower body are still working. They're just not getting the messages from the brain. So they're either sensing something or the muscles are getting tight and that's uh, putting, giving some input to the nerves. They're trying to send a message to the brain that says, you know, stretch your muscle or relax your leg, but the brain's not getting those messages, so that response is not coming. So if you can manually take your leg and stretch them out, that's really the first line. Now, um, some, that works for some people, and for some people their spasms so great, they might have to do a little bit more, um, you know, to get that. A little bit more meaning either medication or uh, Botox injections to kind of settle those muscles down a little bit so they're not uh, giving that feedback um, to the nerve to tighten up. And then also if you can stretch those uh, muscles and nerves and fatigue them, they're not going to be so tight anymore. So um, there are some things um, that uh, through some stimulation that can help as well. Um, again, this epidural stimulation will provide that feedback to these uh, nerves and muscles. Um, they'll get some feedback, and the body will know what to do with it once it gets the, it gets the feedback. So um, that will be helpful in the future. But as of right now, um, so could they improve? Yes. yes. Uh, spasticity can improve as time goes by. It can also um, get more intense. And then some people just kind of 
um, reach a certain point in their spasticity and it just kind of evens out. It's there, but they're either treating it or they're able to control it. Or sometimes it's so minor it just doesn't bother people. Now, if you have a lot of spasticity, that's hard to imagine. But some people have some spasticity and it's just not, um, it just doesn't bother them so much. Either they don't feel it or it's just not, uh, it's just not affecting them in that sort of way. So all of those things can happen, but keep up your exercises and your routines because keeping your body healthy is going to be important for this epidural stimulation when it comes out. You need to have your body in good shape. So um, the fact that you're getting some um, uh, spasticity, um, this is kind of a little bit, odd in thinking but um, spasticity can be so annoying but every time you have spasticity you should think great I'm having spasticity because my nerves are still working they're not getting the message that they need but they're still working and so that's great now if you have an injury in the lumbar or the sacral that's what we call a reflexic injury and usually you don't have any spasticity in those kind of injuries the nerves and muscles are still there. They're just not uh, reacting in any way. So that doesn't mean that's bad. That just means you have a different kind of injury. So don't panic if you don't have spasticity. But if you do, it's not necessarily a bad thing, and it can be harnessed for using other kinds of uh, therapies. Okay, the next question is, uh, what is something we can do to help with enema? Okay, this is a very good question because um, uh, in rehabilitation, we prefer people not to do enemas to control their bowels. People like to use enemas. It's fast and um, it doesn't take a lot of time. And uh, you just wash, what you're doing is you're washing out the bowel and with the fluid out comes any kind of uh, fecal material. Okay, here is the problem with enema. It's kind of a higher level treatment. So if you keep washing out your bowel, what happens is your bowel gets used to doing that and it kind of stops working. So if you think about any kind of treatment uh, that might be taken, um, if you start relying on something else, your body gets um, used to having that something else. Here's a real simple example. So a lot of times after spinal cord injury, people will wear a neck, a neck collar if they have um, an injury to their uh, cervical area up in their neck. So they start wearing that neck collar. It could be a hard one. It could be a soft one. What happens is you start relying on the neck collar, and so when the neck collar comes off, your muscles holding up your head which is kind of heavy. Your head's kind of a heavy thing on top of this little golf tee called your neck. And so what happens is that head get, becomes too heavy. The muscles have become weakened because you're used to that collar being there. And so you have to rebuild up those muscles. That's kind of the same thing that happens when you use enema. That water goes in and flushes out the system. It might go high up into the bowel, and in the bowel you have all those little cilia. They're called little cilia. They're little projections that help move the fecal material through your body. It's an automatic process, and these little finger-like projections, they're microscopic. They're moving the stool down. And I think of fingers, I think of them waving, saying, stool, come this way, come this way. And so that's what happens. When you have that enema, it kind of washes out all that stool and it prevents those fingers from working, the cilia, so they just stop working. And so the more enemas you use, the more difficult it is to have a bowel program, or to have a bowel movement. So what we try to do is we try to get everybody on a bowel program. Now, people don't like this because they have to insert their finger to put the suppository in. They have to do digital stimulation very gently to relax that internal sphincter. And so, but, and it, and it sometimes can take some time to do the bowel program. But what happens is then you have the enema reserved for any kind of emergency. So if you get uh, an impaction, you can get that relieved with the enema. Once you have uh, started into enema, there's really no way uh, 
uh, to go back. So what you need to do is to talk to your um, healthcare professional and say, I'd like to start a bowel program and get off the enemas and start working with them for your individual um, ability to do this. So what happens with most often with the bowel program is you usually start out with a suppository every other day, which can be a Ducalax or a magic bullet. Uh, if the person's older, if they're a child, they usually start with a glycerin suppository. Use the suppository. You do digital simulation. Make sure your finger is gloved and has a lot of lubricant on it to help avoid um, hemorrhoids and fissures and all those kind of things that can happen in the lower bowel. Uh, do the digital stimulation, and then uh, the bowel movement will come. Now, it might be difficult getting started once you're trying to get off the enemas. So you might need to increase your fiber. Um, you might want to. Um, you might need to take some kind of uh, oral medication to get the process flowing. It might take a while um, to get it all organized. The bowel program is usually done every other day, but people can convert back to a bowel program. So um, talk to your healthcare professional about what would be best for you as an individual. I can talk in general terms, but there might be something unique or I don't know how long you've been doing enemas. There is also another thing called an, a mini enema that only works in the lower bowel, and that might be a good um, alternative as well. So um, there's a couple of things for that. Uh, probably if you're having trouble with enemas, it's probably because you've been doing them for a long time and the bowel doesn't want to work anymore. It just wants the enema to do it. It's it's um, it's kind of a, a backwards process, but uh, you can do this. And so talk to your healthcare professional. There's a lot of information about bowel programs. There's booklets and uh, information through the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation that will give you all the detail. Uh, use gravity sitting up. That certainly helps. Be sure your diet has a lot of fiber. Be sure you're uh, drinking enough fluids. That's not upsetting your bladder uh, catheterization program, but it's giving enough moisture to your bowel. Okay, so you can be able to switch that around. The next question is similar um, to the question before, that this person is having some um, some pain. They can move their arms and legs, but they're having some pain and they're having some ver uh, vertigo and Bell's palsy, which is a facial droop on one side. Bell's palsy will resolve on its own. Uh, some people get full function back. Some people don't get full function back, but that does resolve. Um, and so how does one contain mind to enable functionality? When you're having all that severe pain and dizziness, it's very hard um, to just kind of get up in the morning because you hurt. And when you get up and you're having this dizziness, um, there are some uh, physical therapy treatments that can help with uh, vertigo. And so check with your healthcare professional about getting treatment for that. Um, if you're having uh, a lot of significant pain, there's medications that you can take. Again, doing that exercise very, very gently. It seems counterintuitive, and I was just at the Abilities Expo and we were talking about this. Um, if you get a chance to go to the, one of the Abilities Expos, they're just fabulous. This one last week was in Boston. Uh, next month in October, it will be in San Mateo, just outside of San Francisco, but it travels all around the country. You get to see all kinds of things that are new, and um, you get to talk to people. So I, as well as a lot of different people from a lot of different areas, uh, go to these things. So um, we were talking about movement, and a lot of times people say, oh, no, I hurt, I can't move. I don't want to move my leg because it's hurting or I, I having spasticity. But if you very gently move it and start stretching out those nerves and muscles, that will certainly help. So sometimes people, they move less because they hurt, and the less they move, the more they hurt, and it just keeps building and building. So if you can get some movement in there, that will certainly help um, help with that. But also speak to your um 
your healthcare professional about your vertigo because that needs to be straightened out first. So vertigo is what happens when people, are, they just feel dizzy all the time and the world's kind of swimming around them. So it's very difficult to navigate in that kind of world. So start with that because there are some physical therapy treatments that will certainly help with the vertigo. Um, so that would be the first place to start there. Next question is about any new advances in treating muscle spasms. And, uh, well, the newest ad adv advancement, I would say, is the Botox, which has been around for a while. But that's injecting a little bit of a uh, drug into the area where the spasm is. And what happens is that the um, muscle gets uh, temporarily uh, quieted for a period of time. Botox injections have to be repeated. And so um, what happens with that is that it, it breaks down the muscle just enough to stop the spasms. Um, so that has been that has been another game changer. It's been around for a while, and so um, that is a possibility. Now the other thing is, I go back to this epidural stimulation. Um, that certainly helps. But the other thing is, there's nerve stimulators that can be applied uh, to the area where the spasm is, and so that helps um, reduce that spasming. And when the spasm reduces, then the muscle pain reduces. So. Um, there are uh, uh, nerve, electrical nerve treatments for spasms that are available. Not every payer will pay for it. It has to be carefully um, documented by your healthcare professional. You might have to get an exemption to your payer to get these, but they will. The healthcare professional will know how to do that through letters of medical necessity. Not always will the health health insurance. Uh, even cover it. They might say, this is what our policy is that you have purchased, this is the treatment you get, and that's all we're obligated for. But again, if you do those stretching exercises and if you um, can get any Botox or electrical stimulation treatment, uh, even for an isolated area, that certainly will help get you started. Okay, so we have a few more minutes, and there's a few more questions down here. Oh, um, our good friend Bernadette um, is, has written in and says she uses the TheraBand to help stretch. And thank you, Ber Bernadette. That is an excellent suggestion. So TheraBand is like a gigantic rubber band. You can go to um, the drugstore and buy TheraBand. You can buy it off the Internet. It's really not too awfully expensive. If you're going to therapy, you can ask for um, you can ask for exercises using Theraband, and what it is is like a, a long sheet, uh, maybe about four inches wide, but it can come in any length, in, um, and you can use it by um, like making a loop in it, putting it over your foot, and then using that as a resistance for your foot or your leg or your arm or whatever you're trying to exercise. And so I thank you for bringing that up because TheraBand is uh, really quite a wonderful thing. It gives a little more oomph to your workout. Um, another person has written in, as I work my way from higher strength painkillers down to lower strength, I find hydrocodone to be particularly difficult more than any other. Is this typical? Well, you know, hydrocodone is a, a peculiar little drug because uh, some people find it very, very helpful, and many other people don't really find it helpful at all. So um, if your pain is from nerve pain, hydrocodone does not affect nerve pain. It makes you uh, sleepy, it makes you tired, so you don't recognize pain, but it doesn't really affect nerve pain. So uh, you might want to talk to your healthcare professional if you're having uh, nerve pain to think about uh, Neurontin or Lyrica to help you come down off some of those uh, higher strength painkillers. Um, what happens in neuropathic pain is people start out, they get a little bit of pain, um, 
uh, they start taking medication. The pain gets worse. They they have to take more medication because your body gets accustomed to pain medication. And so I understand this problem of trying to come off the pain medication because sometimes people get on so much because they keep trying to treat it and adding more and adding more, and eventually it's just a conglomeration of pain medication. So oftentimes we have people cut their pain medication to see... If, if the neuropathic pain is still as it was, because after a while, sometimes neuropathic pain kind of dissipates a little bit. It kind of lessens. And so hydrocodone is one of those pain medications that's um, very addictive. So you want to think about that. Um, there, If you are past the um, Neurontin Lyrica kind of medication, you can try antidepressants or anticonvulsants in very, very super small, tiny amounts. And those are a little bit easier to get off. Those do affect nerve pain. So um, maybe trying some of the nerve medications or getting on some of these other medications. Now, sometimes people will say, oh, but Linda, I don't have any depression or I don't have seizures, so I really don't need that medication. When you take these uh, medications for nerve pains, it's, uh, it will not be enough to treat depression or seizures. So for depression or seizures, you might take like 100, 150 milligrams of these medications. For nerve pain, you take like 10 milligrams. So it's a lot different medication. It's, it's, it really helps, but that's one of the side effects they found from antidepressants and anti-seizure uh, medications is that they really help nerve pain. But you don't need to take um, a lot of that. So, um, you know, see how long you, you know, talk. I see you're under regular care with physicians. So uh, talk um, to your physicians about hydrocodone or if there's something uh, that might be more practical for you, and that would be those antidepressant, anti-seizure medications or the Neurontin Lyrica in a small dose. And uh, because the hydrocodone is is probably particularly difficult for you because it's probably not really helping you that much. So um, think about those kind of things. So um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, uh, Oh, what are some alternatives to epidural stimulation? Well, that's a good question. Um, So right now, um, there are um, treatments that are out there that are not paid for uh, consistently, and they're very expensive, but there are some uh, electrical stimulation therapies that are, again, attached to the skin uh, that helps uh, build uh, the muscles and stimulate the nerves. Um, uh, The equipment is quite expensive. Oftentimes, insurance does not pay for it. One of the possibilities that you may have, even if you have Medicaid, a possibility is that uh, just about every payer will give you two weeks a year for uh, mobility evaluation and training. So if your provider will bill for your services um, uh, using functional electrical stimulation, uh, but using it externally on the skin, um, you can get this therapy sometimes if it's billed for as mobility training, because that is what you're doing. You're adding mobility to your body. And so what happens is people generally uh, use a biking type system. Electrodes are placed on the um, thighs and on the glutes. And so electricity is put into your body. If you have any kind of sensation, you absolutely cannot do this, but you can, if you have sensation, you can do it passively. Um, But to do this electrical stimulation, the electricity is applied and supplied through the skin to your body and you pedal a bicycle or, or, but after you use your two weeks of mobility training, um, you know, now the equipment's gone and you don't have access to this anymore. There are some uh, therapy centers who have opened their gyms in the evening time and have allowed people to go in for a very nominal fee and use the equipment. Um, Some people are able to get the equipment through their payer. 
uh, to be used at home, but again, this is a process to get this because it's not usually in people's um, payer sources. It usually is not covered for this kind of equipment. So you would need to have your, um, your practitioner write a letter of medical necessity and ask if you can be exempted. I will tell you right now the first letter that will be sent, there will be an automatic response that will uh, be sent to you that will say, no, you cannot have this equipment. It's not covered in your policy. So expect a denial. That's just the way it works. Um, work very carefully with your health care provider. They need to write the letter to explain why you need this particular piece of equipment um, because it's going to reduce your spasticity, because it's going to maintain your nerves and muscles, um, because of you know a variety of reasons. It's going to help your blood flow. It's going to help your cardiovascular system. It's going to reduce your risk of diabetes. I mean, the list goes on and on. And they, they can go to the uh, source of the these people that manufacture this equipment and their sample letters there that they can even use. And there's a lot of information in the healthcare literature about how beneficial this is. And so they, they will be able to write the letter in medical terms uh, that will help influence the in insurance. But since you are the holder of the policy, you're the person who owns the healthcare, uh, the insurance policy, the response will be sent to you, not to your provider. So as soon as you get that response, and the first time I can guarantee you it's going to be a denial, as soon as you get that response, then you take it right over to your health care provider, and they'll have to write a rebuttal to that response. They might need to talk, um, depends on what the um, payer indicates in the letter. There might need to be a meeting between your health care provider and the medical director of the insurance company where they all get together. If you have a case manager through your insurance company, this would be an excellent person to help you advocate uh, for this kind of equipment. Um, they, they probably have heard it about it. Maybe they don't know that much about it. They might need to have more education about it. Um, they might need to work with the uh, physical therapist that will be doing the training or the health care provider that can educate them more about it. But they're also an excellent resource. So uh, these are uh, opportunities that... Um, that would be available to you to get some of this equipment. There again, if you you know if you don't have the equipment or if you don't have the ability, uh, maybe there's not a center close to you. Maybe your physical therapist does not know about the equipment or how to use it. Have them call us a major spinal cord center, and they are usually happy to work have their physical therapist work with your physical therapist so that they get the understanding of how to use this equipment. So it's not impossible, but it takes a lot of work to be able to get some of these different pieces of equipment. So it, you know, it, it's a long and arduous task. I think as more and more of this epidural stimulation comes into play, the insurance companies are going to be able to look at it. It's going to be a lot less cost for them, a lot more quality of care for, uh, of life for you, and they're going to be able to see the cost-benefit ratio. Right now, I don't think they pay for a lot of this kind of higher tech stuff because it is hugely expensive. The cost will come down as these things uh, become more and more studied, researched, and understood, and the equipment will become the it will become a lot less expensive as technology advances. As I say, we're just really on the we're just really stepping off the cliff for this. So, um, just a few years back, biking was the the thing using the uh, skin stimulation, and results were being had with that. Now, it's uh, the equipment has been miniaturized into this epidural stimulation. And so things are just taking uh, leaps and steps. Again, I realize one second is too long to wait when you're uh, waiting, but we're going to see this come to fruition here pretty quickly. So maintain your ability. We have hope. Christopher Reeve was a great one in um, 
outlining hope, and he was working towards that, and, you know, by golly, he did it. So I think we have to give a lot of credit to him for getting this whole thing uh, out in the public eye, getting it going, getting research funding for this, starting the foundation, and also a great thanks to Dr. Edgerton and Dr. Harkima, who have really taken this into the 21st century and provided a lot of hope for a lot of people. As I say, it's very small numbers right now, but things are really um, breaking out. And as their success increases, we will see this more and more across the country. And so it's um, just not going to be that long until here we have it. So with that, we're at the top of the hour. And so, you know, such a great high to leave on. Um, the thought that the the future is upon us right now. And with that, I'd like to thank you um, for listening today. And please uh, remember that on Wednesday evenings, I am available if you want to write in any questions, if you have any uh, further information, just write it into the blog. You can write into the blog at any time and answer and ask any questions. But on Wednesday evenings, I am available. So please feel free to do that, and I'll see you on the blogosphere. Thank you so much. Bye. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.